Did I tell you the story when uh, one of my friends was offered uh, to buy from me? So I was in Upper Egypt, and uh, I, I was traveling with a young lady, and uh, a third woman, a little bit older, uh, sort of was traveling alone. It's not terribly comfortable. She asked to join us and said, that's fine. So the three of us were sitting there uh, in near Aswan, <coughs> and um, there was uh, two men sitting sort of across the room, one of them dressed in clearly Arab garb, and one dressed in rather modern, uh, you know, suit. And at some point, uh, the, the guy in the suit came over, introduced himself very politely, and he was a Palestinian, and the other man was a Saudi Arabian sheikh, and uh, they had noticed that I had two wives, and uh <coughs> so the sheikh had uh, wanted to know, uh, would like to purchase the second, the older one, the second wife from me. And since it was the somewhat older one, he thought I wouldn't mind very much. <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful scene because, <laughs> as, as you know, Palestinians are very sophisticated. They've been living uh, with Jews you know, who are basically Europeans for a very long time, so they're you know, just like anybody else. <laughs> uh, but the, the uh, Saudi Arabian sheikh was obviously living uh, not in the modern world, and this poor Palestinian had to intermediate. So he was very scared. <laughs> You know, how I would respond, would I make a scene, would I slug him, <laughs> would I try to get him arrested, or you know, any of this sort of stuff. But of course it was immediately obvious to me what was going on and to, to, to my two lady friends. And so we played it very cool and we, you know, please sit down, let's discuss this. <laughs> you know, how old, how old is the sheikh? Uh, how many wives does he already have? How many has he divorced? Does he have any concubines in addition? to his wives, how much money he had, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have a very, very nice, polite thing. And you could just see the intermediary, you know, <laughs> his face just relax, <laughs> you know, because he was, he was expecting, you know, something terrible. But everybody played along, it went off very well. And in the, in the, in the middle of this, um, the, the sheikh calls the, the intermediary o over back to him, and they talk something, and out comes a, a velvet purse given to the Palestinian, and he gives me as a sign of good, of good faith on the part of Saudi Arabia, he wanted me to have this. What is it? A set of Muslim prayer beads. Pro beautiful cat's eye stones, many, not just a chain, but beautiful, beautiful uh, handiwork, and probably very valuable. I was looking for it uh, to bring to the, yes, actually last time, and I can't find it right now. <laughs> um, but everything worked out. <coughs> the woman paid very great attention to what was going on. And uh, we said politely at the end that we would consider and give them an answer tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, in the end, she didn't want to be bought, even though she was obviously going to have some good chunk of change <laughs> out of it. <coughs> or at least I was. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, the other two uh, things are, will have to be delayed, because Eliezeri is not here, and we have to add something to Noah's presentation. <coughs> Okay, let's skip that. So, last time we were discussing Europe, and uh, we're coming into the, we start to discuss the Middle Ages, and we start with Europe because we have the best data. We have very, very good data about lots and lots of things from Europe. It's not so good from the rest of the world. And from, from about, for about 500 years, from 1200 to 1700, the data, poor as the data is, uh, shows that population really didn't rise uh, terribly much. They were in some sort of a, of, of a stasis. And the reasons for this uh, w w we discussed a little bit. We talked about the plague, and the plague lasted like 500 years. Um, uh, since we're going to skip this, after sh this is, um, oops. There we go. <coughs> so remember, the plague hit Europe in 1347. So this table where they have good data starts 200 years later. The plague has been around for 200 years, and still there's a number of cases. That's not individual, not individuals, but different cities and places in which there was an outbreak, and we just don't have good records of how many people died. But 1550, 1600, 1650, see the plague is dying out slowly, and there's many, many theories whether people got resistance to it or the rats that carried it died. 
uh, were outcompeted by another species of rats. Not known, but the plague did eventually die out. But from 1347 uh, to 1849 is 500 years where the plague keeps uh, recurring. So that was clearly one of the reasons why population uh, couldn't grow. Uh, then there was violence. There was constant small level violence. And then when the Protestant Reformation happened, the religious wars broke out. And uh, according to uh, one of the standard textbooks of European history, uh, they ran from 1531 up to 1657. So another 130 years uh, of slaughter. And they rolled around different places in Europe. And by the time they were done, the most contested Southern Europe uh, stayed Catholic, and the very Northern Europe became Protestant. But the middle of Europe was strongly contested. And so something like a third to a half of everybody got killed uh, in this time be because of the religious wars. This is the period that Malthus is describing. And we'll come back to Malthus that, Mal that Malthus knew about. Uh, this is the history that he understood. And we'll come back to what his theories were. But the historians now agree pretty much that productivity of the land, especially agriculture, because that was the, the main occupation, was rising very slowly during this period. But population was also rising very slowly during this period. So pretty much the gains in agricultural productivity were balanced by the gains in population. And the average standard of living uh, did not improve. And we'll talk a good bit more about that. Now, why? So the question, uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious why they were not able to improve agricultural productivity, why they were not able to significantly improve uh, any other kind of manufacturing productivity, why they were not able to do anything uh, to fight these diseases. And it comes down to that not only was there no sci scientific knowledge, as we currently understand the word scientific, there really wasn't any particular interest in intellectually in the real world. Everything was focused on religion and the, the, the other world. So there was not a lot of intellectual energy expended in trying to understand what was going on uh, around your feet, so to speak. And because that all kinds of problems that we take for granted, all kinds of ways of dealing with the real world, just were not, even, were not really thought about uh, in any serious way. So sanitation. Up until uh, the 18th century, uh, up until uh, the 1800s, actually, uh, the sanitation in Europe was just absolutely atrocious. Uh, there was no system for disposing of human waste. Nobody bothered to pay attention to what to do uh, with human waste. And feces were basically everywhere. Wherever you went, there, there was someone else's uh, feces. Um, in the 18th century, uh, the city streets everywhere had ditches down the middle of the street. And that's where the feces got dumped. There were buckets inside the house, and some servant or the housewife would take the bucket and dump it into these ditches. Um, and they were also used as latrines. People would just go out there, and if they didn't have a bucket in the house, or they didn't have a house, go in and do it in the latrine. Again, in each case, I'm gonna I was in uh, Belize, Belize City in, in, Latin Amer in Central America, as you know, not that many years ago, in the middle of the street is one big latrine, and the stink was just in, in, incredible. Um, so uh, now, you didn't actually have to, were not required to actually take the, your bucket of feces and, and dump them in the street. You could throw them out your window. And, but eventually, people did start thinking about that. And uh, the, the issue was not to dump it on someone's head. And uh, in Ed Edinburgh, in, in Scotland, they rang bells at 10 PM at night when they figured people should be off the street. And that was the specified time for dumping excrement out your window. Some of the older of you that were properly brought up, the young men, were maybe told that you should walk on the street side uh, when you're escorting a young lady. Do you know what that's for? When stuff gets dumped out the window, it's not to for prevent spat splash from cars. It's, it's way, be way earlier than cars. It was to, so that when someone dumped stuff out the window, it would, uh, the lady would be under some kind of uh, awnings there. Um, 
And it wasn't only the, the common people, the poor, the uneducated uh, that were living in such filth. It went right up to the royalty. So, and we have records of this. In 1665, uh, there was a great plague in London, one of those uh, that I've showed you there. And that's the one that written about by uh, Robinson Crusoe author, <laughs> uh, Daniel Defoe. And so King, the King, Charles II, uh, in his court, took his refuge in Oxford University. Now, Yale is modeled after, a lot of Yale is modeled after Oxford, so you have a good uh, image of what it looks like. And the plague was over, took about a year, the plague was over, they, they went back to London and just left whatever they left <laughs> in Oxford. And the cleaning people came in, and what did they find? Excrement everywhere. They described it, excrement in every corner, in chimneys, in studies, in coal houses, in cellars, uh, just all over the place. Now, some of this information comes from the diary of Samuel Pepys. How many of you are aware of this? Some of you, again, if you've taken uh, history or literature. He was a famous diarist uh, from that. He was England's first Secretary of the Admiralty, a member of Parliament, President of the Royal Scientific Society. So he was not your ordinary average guy. He was educated in money and uh, in the upper classes. But he writes that he didn't, when he had to defecate in the middle of the night, he didn't bother to go to the privy. Uh, he just deposited his feces in the fireplace. So uh, you can see that it was a smelly place to live in. Now, along with that no concern or no thought about where you deposit uh, your excrement, uh, the idea of keeping drinking water separate from this excrement was not in anybody's uh, mind. That very often, if there were public uh, holes of, of, of some place where the public could go to do their thing, then maybe right next to it uh, was a drinking fountain. Uh, and in terms of the waste uh, in the streets, um, it wasn't just feces, but everything else was just dumped into the streets. So. Uh, England especially had lots of animals. Europe, Europe had animals, un unlike China. And um, when animals died, just left in the middle of the street to rot. Butchers that pulled out the entrails, the guts of the animals and unedible parts, dump it in the street. Uh, and so the streets are just full of not only human action, but the waste of, of all the animals. And of course, the flies and insects lay their eggs in it and, and, and grow. And it's very unsanitary. Uh, dead people were not handled uh, any better than this. As more people died, the urban cemeteries got filled up. There was not uh, uh, so, so much space, and so they stopped burying the poor people in properly in cemeteries, but just what they call poor holes, just uh, large pits in which piles of bodies were just laid uh, out side by side, row by, row by row, and row on top of row, and they were not closed until they were full. So you had these pits of rotting bodies just festering there in the middle of all the cities that had enough people to bury. And of course, the stench was just overwhelming. And the rich people were not buried in these pits, but if they were, they could be buried in cemeteries, but if they were really important, they bought space in the church crypt, or they contributed money and got space in the church crypt. You know, many of you have undoubtedly gone to churches in the basement. They've got these crypts uh, of dead people. And uh, guess, guess what? <laughs> they were rotting and, and, and stank, so the churches uh, stank. And uh, one quote is that they stank out parson and congregation, <laughs> that people just couldn't stand uh, to be there. In 1742, Dr. Johnson, who you know wrote The Life of Boswell, uh, I'm, so <laughs> John, I'm sorry, ba has Boswell's Life of Johnson, so he's quoting Johnson, uh, described London as a city, quote, which abounds with such heaps of filth as a savage would look on with amazement. So uh, the death rate, cities were so unhealthy from all this filth, that the death rates were enormously high and cities did not keep themselves going. It left to itself a city's population would just disappear. And some estimates are that about every generation, about a third of the inhabitants of a city would, would, die, would 
I mean, everybody died, but the population left of the city just left to itself would go down by a third in every generation. And the only reason that cities were able to prosper was that in the countryside, where things were healthier just because of space, there wasn't the demography, there wasn't the, the crowding uh, of people, that constantly the excess births, the excess population from the countryside would keep migrating into the cities because uh, they had primogeniture in England, for instance. Only the oldest son could inherit the land, so younger sons had to migrate into the cities or into the army, and uh, that's what kept the cities going. It was a constant stream of people coming in uh, from the countryside. Now, it's not only London and the great cities, and it's not only that part of Europe, but we have descriptions of uh, some of the other cities, and uh, one of them is currently politically uh, very relevant, uh, is Jerusalem. And uh, now all the great Western religions claim that Jerusalem is central to their religion, and they compete viciously, they fight viciously over Jerusalem. And they all claim that they've been interested forever, you know, in this. But in fact, it was until, until Napoleon uh, expedition to Egypt in the Middle East, it was totally uh, ignored as a physical thing. From the Crusades to Napoleon, it was, it was totally ignored. In 1840, it was a tiny town of 15,000 people, uh, 7,000 Jews, 5,000 Muslims, 3,000 Christians from the records that we have. In a place like that, presumably the, the seat of, of the Western religions, the feces were 50 feet deep and had been collecting uh, since the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans. Before the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, there was a, some sort of sanitation going on. Uh, but uh, between then and 1840, the feces <coughs> just kept, kept going up. Of course, by the, in this filth, everybody was sick. Basically, everyone had malaria. Malaria was endemic there. When cholera came through, which it came periodically, 75% of the people would die of it. And one quote describing this, the sanitary condition of the city of God <coughs> ensured that any pilgrim who sought, to, who sought to spend his last days on earth there could look forward to fulfilling that ideal with great dispatch. <coughs> So personal cleanliness, this was also unknown. Uh, we have one professor of medieval history who gives a great lecture. <laughs> if she ever gives it as a public lecture that I've seen him give. If he ever gives it again, absolutely go. It's called A Thousand Years Without a Bath. So this is in Europe. Uh, the Romans uh, were very careful ab about personal uh, cleanliness, and they built these great big baths. And we visited like the Baths of Caracalla, in, in Rome, a couple of you have. How about the bath, bath, the city in England named after its baths and so forth? All these are Roman uh, creations. So the Romans were uh, very careful uh, uh, as much as they could in a place like that uh, with personal hygiene. But after the fall of Rome, the morality changes, the church takes over, and the church wants people to concentrate on their souls, not on their bodies. And washing was considered too much a sign of preoccupation uh, with the body, and especially for women. It's not good for women to pay too much attention to their bodies. Um, so, uh, Europeans at that time boasted, and you've probably heard this, that they only wash three times in their lives. How many of you have heard that? Once when they're born, once they get married, and once when they die. <laughs> they get washed three, and, and the rest of that, not only didn't they wash, they thought that water that you washed with carried disease, contagion, or you know, various theories, and that if you washed, you would probably get sick from the washing. So the solution was not cleanliness, the solution to the bad conditions, but perfume. And perfume comes up in this era because people stank so much that if they had the money, they would buy uh, perfume. Anybody know why? Yeah? Louder, louder. Th was a good question. Was the water likely to make them sick? If they drank the water, yes. If they washed in the water, no. There's very little in temperate zone waters that's going to get through your skin. In uh, tropical zones, there can be parasites in there, and they can be dangerous. But in, in Europe, I'm not sort of aware of anything that washing in the water will, will, will get, you, get you sick. 
So on the other hand, if you wash yourself on the stays on your skin and then you eat or something, could you then like uh, uh, yes, if you wash yourself, it stays on your, your skin and then you, you eat with your unwashed hands. Well, probably what was on there before you washed is gonna be worse. In, in general, I think nobody washes unless something comes off, that, that the burden of whatever's on there it gets less. <coughs> so all of these things are what we modern people think about. But obviously back then, just these kind of very simple, straightforward questions were not really uh, considered. <coughs> people back then, George Washington, King George, wore wigs. Anybody know why? Some of you probably know why, why they wear wigs. Underneath the wig was? What? Lots of lice. Shaved heads, they had lice. Lice was endemic, they couldn't get rid of it, so they shaved their heads. I think we just saw that on television with the John Adams story. He every so often, did any of you see that TV show? HBO? Anyway, he takes off his, his, his wig and there he is, bald. Uh, that was to prevent uh, <coughs> lice. Okay, so one of the reasons, uh, one of the major reasons for this lack of population growth for hundreds of years in Europe, just no idea about sanitation, hygiene, any of this kind of stuff. Another aspect which you'll be reading about uh, is infanticide. Infanticide was a very large factor in European demography and the rest of the world, as you will read about. <coughs> but uh, in Europe, it was very important. In the, uh, there was always a, a, a level of infanticide and of various sorts. But in the 18th and 19th centuries, it apparently exploded, the number of kids that were done away with. In Milan, uh, from 1840s to 1860s, one third of all children born to married parents, we're not talking about unmarried situations, were left at foundling homes. And uh, in foundling homes, the, the death rate was near 100%. Uh, more than half of all the children born to working class parents were left in foundling homes and almost all the illegitimate children were abandoned. And the death rates, it, it was a form of infanticide. You just gave it into a foundling home, they were taken basically no care of, they died. It was out of sight. And again, not just the ordinary ignorant person, but you all know Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the famous French philosopher, and, and wrote a lot that encouraged the American Revolution. Uh, this is a quote from him. My third child, was thus deposited in a foundling home, just like the first two. And I did the same with the two following. I had five in all. The arrangement seemed to me so good, so sensible, so appropriate, that if I did not boast of it publicly, it was solely out of regard for their mother. That there was no, here they were, they were abandoning these children uh, to almost certain death, and it not, uh, there was just no moral compunction uh, about it whatsoever. <coughs> Aside from absolute abandonment to foundling homes or other, just leaving them in the streets, you'll read about America and, and England where the kids were just often left in the streets. Um, another mechanism was sending out children to nurse with wet nurses. And uh, the death rate of wet nurse children was enormously high. So, if parents tried to rear their children, the death rate was about one in six at, at, this, at this time. Uh, but in 18th century France, between a half and two thirds of infants that were sent out to nurse died. Uh, and, and even at a higher death rate were the so-called baby farms. In, in the 19th century Europe, there were was like we call them puppy mills now, they were baby farms, and they took in vast numbers of children to presumably wet, wet nurse, but almost none of them uh, survived. <coughs> and as I showed you from these and all kinds of reasons, about a third of children died in infancy. The idea of being a parent and, and, and the family idea of child rearing was completely different uh, than we now understand. So, the standard thing was a child is born, is almost immediately sent out to wet nurse, someone that doesn't care about them, 
A lot was written about wet nurses getting drunk, having the baby in bed, getting drunk, rolling over on the baby, and squashing the baby. Whether that was an excuse or, or the real reason for the child's death is, is unknown. But they would wet nurse for, uh, for a couple of years, and then those that were still alive would come back home, uh, maybe uh, age two or three or something. And then by age seven, they would be sent back out to work again as an apprentice somewhere. And how many of you read Charles Dickens and David Copperfield and Oliver Twist? What age were they sent out to work? Seven. Seven is the standard age. This is scenes of one of the Dickens characters uh, going to work in a dye factory, dyeing cloth, and comes out black every day covered uh, with the dye. And so that was, that was quite a standard thing. In 1646, uh, the rich and very progressive town of Leiden in, in the Netherlands, Leiden was one of the most advanced places in Europe, limited the working day to children to 14 hours. The, whether the law was obeyed or not, we don't know, but children could not do that. And of course, Charles Dickens is a couple of hundred years later in the 19th century. And apparently, in every one of his novels, there's some scene of child labor going on. Now, I'm talking about up to the 1800s, but this does not disappear. Now you look what Europe, the situation Europe was in in 1800, some of the developing countries are currently in. So official figures from India, the government figures, say there are 12 million child workers in India. Opponents, activists on, on the labor issue, estimate that it's closer to 60 million children in India are, are working. Uh, the they do have child labor laws now in India, and they prohibit children uh, under age 14 from working in hazardous jobs. Uh, when the uh, scandal about Gap, the G our clothing manufacturer Gap, uh, came out, uh, the factories that were investigated had children as young as 10 years old, working up to 16 hours a day making the dungarees and, and what that, that we wear. So all of this sort of misery uh, leads not only physical uh, misery, but a change in attitude toward, toward life. And death came very easily. It was very common. And so life was, was cheaper. There's no question about it from the, from the literature that life was cheaper than we, we consider now. And because children especially were so likely to die, as well as anyone else, it was considered imprudent, not, not, not wise, to be particularly affectionate with or emotionally entwined with any other human being. Your husband might die immediately, your kids might die, your wife might, might die. And so, as far as we can tell from the writings of the period, what we call affective relationships, emotional relationships, were rather cool in this period, except, of course, violent anger, which always pops out. So, Going back to this, so here's all these problems, and what did people do about some of these things? And so um, in the idea of disease comes from the Greeks, and, and probably farther back than the Greeks, that the body is controlled by four humors, fluids that run around the body, something like the chi of, of, of oriental uh, uh, thought. Uh, and these four humors must be in balance. And when you got sick, the problem was that the humors got out of balance. So one of the things you did was get bled. That was a standard procedure. Let the blood flow because that gets rid of the evil humors. And George Washington was apparently killed by an excess of, of bloodletting. So when he was older, he got uh, quite sick. And the doctors, as, as, while he was sick, bled five pints of blood out of him. And then he died. So we take, when we go to take blood, they take one pint. And they consider that sort of the, the maximum safe amount for young, healthy people. Here he was old and sick, five pints, he dies. His Nemesis, there were nemesis, George Washington in America and King George III in England. You know the, the saying, Mad King George? 
Yeah, you know, he was mad. <laughs> and he was mad with a genetic disease called porphyria, which uh, affects the, the hemoglobin in, in the blood. And uh, it caused episodic madness. So he would be sane, then he would be mad, he'd be sane, then he'd be mad. And when he was mad, what did they do? They bled him. They bled him enormously. They tied him to a chair. They did all kinds of things to him. They had no clue e uh, either uh, how to handle any of these diseases, nor of a humane way, no idea of a humane way to treat someone who has something wrong with them that you have no clue uh, what it is or, or what to do about this. And if you ever want to see that, there's a great movie, The Madness of King George, about 1995. If you ever want to, it, it describes this, this aspect of, of his li life. Uh, so leeches, another form of this bloodletting was instead of taking a razor blade and, or a blade and, and, and cutting a vein, which is hard to sew up, leeches are wonderful. So you, you stick leeches on you and the blood, uh, and leeches suck out the blood. And we know this goes back at least to the ancient Romans. And it was practiced for 2,000 years, uh, this bloodletting, on this ancient theory uh, of the humors. 1860, we have data, in the hospitals just in London. So in 1860, that was rural Britannia. England was the richest, most educated ruler of the whole world, right? 1860. In the hospitals in one city in London, seven million leeches were used. <laughs> the idea, again, being that until um, you know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. And, and just use anything, and it's all no evidence whatsoever that any of this ever helped anybody. And of course, we now know it was, in fact, not only didn't it help them, it made them uh, sicker. So uh, we now have uh, sort of a rage in America and Europe for natural med medicine and, and in its various versions. Well, this is, has a very old history. And so how many of you know uh, the author Wilkie Collins, Moonstone? Woman in White, they're, one of the, they're on uh, PBS television all the time. You've, you've seen them. Uh, so he had gout, which was, uh, what happens is, back then they ate a lot of meat, had a lot of uh, uh, protein in the blood. The breakdown product of protein is urea. If you can't, don't excrete it fast enough, it's not very soluble. It crystallizes in your joints. And then every time you move a joint, these little sharp crystals grind in there and it makes it very hard to move and your joints get swollen. Very, very unpleasant disease. So what did they do for gout? In the, at late of the 1880s, they treated gout with a poultice of cabbage leaves covered with silk, with oiled silk. And uh, this particular author, uh, Wilkie Collins, wrote about it. That's how we, we know some of the details. And it didn't give him any relief whatsoever. Surprise, surprise. So what he did, he turned to opium to dull the pain, because opium really does work. It's the basis of, of morphine. And he probably died partly of opium poisoning, because it does other bad things to your system. Now, continuing this, this story of what happened, you know, this all relates to death rates in, in pre-scientific uh, times. So uh, you American history buffs, what happened to President James Garfield? He was? Assassinated. He was shot. But he wasn't really, he was shot, but he wasn't really assassinated because he lived like for a year after he was shot. So whether you call it assassination or not, I don't know. But the, the, the uh, bullet went in apparently into his back and lodged in some fat. Now fat is not very permeable to anything. It's just like the bullet lodges in a lump of fat. The lead doesn't the lead poisoning from the bullet doesn't get out. Nothing much gets out. So it's not a really dangerous thing to have a, a bullet uh, in, 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 a, in a lump of fat. But his doctors, and some of them were homeopaths, which was the big thing back then, and some of them were allopaths. And uh, <coughs> what those words mean, uh, you can ask me after, after class. And they had opposing theories. So homeopaths thought that whatever was wrong with you, and so I am telling you the theories, <laughs> Whatever was wrong with you, you should give a little bit of the same uh, thing, and that would cure you. And little bit meant you could dilute it infinitely so that there was actually nothing in what they were giving you, maybe pure water, but that was supposed to cure you. Allopath was supposed to give them something of the opposite. And there's been home you can see it every drugstore nowadays, homeopathic remedy. And what that legally means is nothing in it. 
you know, uh, but that's okay. And so, uh, but they had these opposite theories, and they kept fighting about what to do uh, with the, this president who was, was sick. So what they did is they stuck metal rods into his wound to try to, you know, pull the bullet out, even though the bullet was no, doing uh, no danger. Although sterilization, uh, had uh, Lister had done his work, it was known already, these doctors didn't believe in that, so they stuck in these metal rods uh, with no sterilization. And uh, it was not, he of course got infected, apparently not from the bullet because he lived a year, but from the metal rods that they kept poking in with him. Their understanding or their interest in, uh, in physiology was, was so nil that they insisted, for reasons that I have not found, that he be fed rectally. So they fed him beef bouillon, egg yolks, milk, whiskey, and drops of op opium rectally. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is the rectum does not absorb food. <laughs> the purpose of the rectum is, is to take water out and, and conserve, conserve water. So, so they're feeding him this way. This is the only way he's allowed to be fed. It's not healthy to put food in this way. And so what happens? What do you think happens? He loses weight. How much did he lose? A hundred pounds from July to September. In three months, this guy loses a hundred pounds. Does anybody notice this? Does anybody pay attention to this? Does anybody have the scientific clue of mind that, well, I have a theory and I'm applying that theory and oh my, it's not working. So maybe my theory is wrong. No, <laughs> that's just not the, the critical scientific mindset. They knew that that was the right thing to do, and so they would not give up uh, their theories, and basically it seems he starved to death. <laughs> they, you know, they infected him and, and starved him to death. So what happens when new ideas do come out in a, in a, in a pre-scientific uh, pre era? So one of the current public health measures is you don't eat food with your hands, right? Your mother tells you that all the time, because you wash your hands first, which they didn't do, but even then you, you eat with a knife and fork, which your mother has, or your, or your dishwasher has, has uh, cleaned very nicely. <coughs> so Europeans, of course, as you've seen from any movie, uh, ate with their hands for many hundreds of years. But at that time, the Arabs were much more civilized than we were, we, the Europeans. Uh, and so in the Levant, uh, the, the, the Middle Eastern coast there, where Venice had lots of commerce, they were already eating with knives and forks, and, and you know, used, used a fork. Well, this was first introduced into the Europe by the Duke of Venice, the Doge of Venice, and his wife became aware that the, the Arab civilization was, was doing this, this thing of eating with forks, and she thought she would introduce it into her dinner parties. So she started uh, having forks at, at her dinner party. And uh, the, uh, there was a, the cardinal, uh, uh, one of the cardinals at that time was St. Peter Damien, and he says that th he was just totally uh, opposed to this. And the idea was that the stuff that you eat are animals and plants, they're God's creations, and that by using a fork, she had set herself up above God's creation. And the quote is, um, uh, to touch meat with a fork was impiously to declare that God's creatures were not worthy of being touched by human hands. And that kind of phrase was repeated uh, all the way into the 17th century, and forks came very uh, slowly into Europe. Uh, lightning rods. When Benjamin Franklin invented lightning rods, what was most likely to get struck by lightning? It was a church steeple, right? because they stuck up into the sky and had points. And as you may know if you take physics, points attract lightning, pointy things. So churches were always getting lightning and, and burned out. So he, uh, Benjamin Franklin invents the lightning rod, and oh my God, the, the opprobrium that, that he came under, because lightning was obviously a, a one of God's creations, that he was punishing uh, people with it. Now Benjamin Franklin was interfering uh, with God's punishment. So, going back to the family, which is relevant to this to population more than lightning. <laughs> um, so, one of the of this whole this whole brutal society in which life is very insecure, people are very violent to each other, 
Uh, they're not careful with the, their persons or anything like that. Ch child rearing practices don't, don't escape uh, this whole context uh, in, in which people lived. And the traditional Christian view in, in the West, uh, and this is strongly reinforced by Calvinist theology after, after the Reformation, was that children were born with original sin. Original sin is the view of human nature. What is human nature considered to be in these times? Now we think of human nature as genes versus environment, but back then it was original sin, and children were born into sin. And the only hope of holding the sin in check was thought to be the most ruthless repression of child's will and his total subordination to the will of the parents. He was to be submitted to, to his parents, to schoolmasters, and to anyone with authority over him. Theologians and moralists insisted that parents ruthlessly crush the wills of young children by physical force, if necessary. So, and that has political ramifications. If you're taught uh, when you're young and your parents believe that the most moral thing is that you must be obedient, you must not have a will of your own, this leads you to believe that authoritarian uh, political structures are the normal and right way that humans should be governed. The American Puritans uh, were very much a part of this, and the primary concern with respect to childbearing of American Puritans was in making children sin-free enough uh, to merit an afterlife. So they threatened totally healthy children by telling them that they would soon die. So Jonathan Edwards, from whom one of the Yale colleges is named, and he was president of Princeton, he was not president of Yale. Once I said he was, I was wrong. Uh, he lectured a group of children. I know you will die in little time, some sooner than others. It is not likely you will all live to grow up. <laughs> now, you know, children's storybooks. One of the popular children's books was, quote, a token for children. Quote, if other children die, why, why may not you sicken and die? So again, we try to protect our children. Nowadays, you know, nurture, loving nurture, try to protect our children from these uh, worries. But back then, one, it was a reality, and two, that reality was used to suppress their, what was called then their, their will, and subject them to enforcement by the parents. And of course, this, in the literature, there's a, this sort of reading of history came about 50 years ago when this was sort of noticed, and there's been a large reaction to it that no, some parents at least were loving during this long stretch of European history, and of course, not, not all parents uh, were sort of so brutal to their children. Um, but some were, the, uh, th they, they were, uh, one of the things was to force a child into the mold, uh, the behavioral mold that you liked him, but also into the physical mold. So girls were supposed to have narrow, narrow bodices, narrow waists. And so there's, a, there's at least one case on record where a girl was put into an iron cage to squeeze her. And as she grew older, uh, the cage squeezed more and more and she couldn't breathe. She died of suffocation from being put in this iron cage to mold her physical body to the shape that was wanted uh, by the parents. And so the conclusion is that life in this um, pre-modern, pre-scientific times was not only sort of miserable in the physical sense, but probably also quite miserable in an emotional, in inward kind of sense, that people were not warm and loving to each other very much, but, but uh, very frequently cold and disciplining and, and, and controlling kind of people. <coughs> so. Uh, so we have some centuries of, of this period, and uh, you can go back to maybe the fall of the Roman Empire when really learning, really learning about reality in the West kind of stopped with, with the fall of Rome. So you have uh, more than a thousand years where sort of no intellectual progress with respect to reality uh, is made. And then things all of a sudden start to change, and we're going to talk about that now. Within 200 years, uh, the death rate 
falls uh, dramatically, and so has the birth rate falls dramatically. And these changes are sort of the centerpiece of, of what, of course, in demography, uh, historical demography anyway, usually studies, called the demographic transition, the fall in the death rate and the fall in the birth rate. So the, you'll, you'll hear this many times because it's so basic, that in these periods, in old periods, the birth rate is very high, the death rate is very high, they're about equal, so population basically grows not at all or very, very slowly. So what we're going to talk about now, in turn, is first the fall in the death rate, and second, then the fall in the birth rate, and then the theories that we have to explain uh, these enormous changes in, in the way what it means to be a human being. So what happened? Uh, we, don't, we don't know the causes. The or, or we have many, many theories, maybe we many, many times know what the causes are. Uh, one of the stand, this standard uh, textbook of European history says, quote, one, this is going back to the wars of religion, which are just before all these changes started happening, before uh, Galileo, for instance. <coughs> one thing was clear, 130 years of senseless bloodletting in the name of religion inevitably sparked off a reaction in the minds of intelligent people. The wars of religion offered fertile soil for the fragile seeds of reason and science. People began to realize that religiosity was hostile to civilization. Europeans said because of this period of sort of utter irrationality, that the, 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 the bad results of it were so immediately obvious to everyone, everyone was getting scared, getting killed by the people in the neighboring town who were of the, the other religion, uh, they rejected all of that and were ready for some sort of a rational uh, attitude toward things. And the results of that, we can see, were really quite dramatic. So here is what we can reconstruct <coughs> of life expectancy and going back 8,000 years ago where the records are very poor, but it certainly wasn't much better than this. And there was wavering and probably some slow increase in life expectancy. This just above 20 years of life expectancy <coughs> is what I showed you in that graph of uh, Cisalpine Gaul from Roman times. And what I've told you is true of Europe during these, these hundreds of years that I've been talking about. And that stays more or less the same with perhaps some improvement it doesn't matter whether you're looking at France, the dotted line, or you're looking at China, the solid line. As far as we can tell, uh, they're pretty much the same until around 1700, all of a sudden, something majorly changes. And the, the, the life expectancy goes, starts going sky high. So we're talking about not just one of many, many things that happened in history uh, that you can take all kinds of history courses about, but in terms of what it means to be a human, you finally can stay alive beyond the age of 20 or, or 25. And that is, is such a tremendous change in, 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 in life that, it, that there's nothing else uh, as important. And of course, a large part of this, to reinforce this, was child infant mortality. A and look what happens. Back here, it's going up and down uh, like crazy. That's very high. Uh, this is a quarter uh, of children. And this is uh, European data. Uh, so this is about a fifth to a quarter of children die uh, as, as children. And it's out of control. You can see that the epidemics come through, and then times get good, and then something else comes through. And so it's very variable and very high. And then it starts swooping downward, and not only does it come down, but it evens out. That, the, that we start getting control, not only over the overall level, but all the things which cause these wild swings in it. So again, uh, uh, an amazing uh, change in, in what it means to be humans. Well, what is this state where things start happening? 1770s, we're into the Enlightenment. And you all have probably, at least in your high school history, uh, have heard of the Enlightenment. And that is the big 
opening out in Europe of rational discourse on almost everything, and everything from, from science to politics. And disease, for instance, uh, was uh, considered divine punishment upon mankind for their sins. That's a quote from somewhere. Medical research was considered sacrilegious. Uh, dissection of cadavers was objected to because, quote, if you cut the bodies into pieces, what's going to happen to them at the time of the resurrection? So there are all kinds of reasons that you shouldn't do anything to get even the most basic knowledge of what's inside uh, a, a human body, and without that you can't make any progress. The major, major event in, in the Enlightenment is Newton's Principia. Newton's discussion of something that sounds rather abstract, you know, what he was worried about was how the bodies go around in heaven. That's what everyone was trying to figure out. That you may remember Copernicus had already said that things didn't go around the earth, but they went around the sun. That was older. Uh, Kepler had gotten the mathematics right, so they went around not in circles, but in ellipses. But nobody had any explanation for this. It was a simple theory. It was great regularity, but no one had any idea why. Newton's gravitation was what made it rational, in the sense of understanding that it was just this simple force of gravity. And people don't always understand the, you know the story of the apple dropping on his head, right? So that, the story is that gave him the idea of gravitation. No, apparently, one, the story is probably apocryphal totally, but the import is what everyone was trying to figure out was the heavenly motions the moon around the earth, the earth around the sun, the planets around, all of these sort of things. And so he goes to sleep under the tree, and the apple falls on his head. And he wakes up and he realizes, oh my god, the apple fell on my head for the same reason that the moon is held in orbit around the earth. As you know, if there was no gravity, the moon would just, here's the earth, the moon goes around, you shut off gravity, the moon goes off in a straight line forever. That was kind of understood already by Galileo, that, that things in motion will go in a straight line unless you pull them in somehow. So they knew that the Earth, the Moon was constantly falling toward the Earth, the Earth was constantly falling toward the Sun, all the planets were constantly falling toward the Sun. That was understood, and they knew that apples fell to the Earth, but they didn't put the two of them together. The great insight of Newton apparently was realizing that this thing on Earth that we could observe and measure on Earth was the same reason that the heavens worked. And this, this was sort of a, a, a bombshell that led to the whole uh, uh, theory of, <coughs> uh, of, uh, of celestial mechanics and, and, and gravitation, and, and all of Western science really starts from this. Within 25 years, and, and people were, he, Newton, Newton was lionized during his lifetime, it was realized what a tremendous achievement uh, this was. Uh, and, uh, and the, the, the relationship to this is not only the scientific <coughs> achievement that, the, that the, the planets orbited by the same forces drops an apple, but it was previously believed that, yes, well, events on Earth might uh, work by some sort of physical laws. You had Galileo working on that. But heaven was ruled by supernatural laws. And now Newton's great insight was, no, they're the same laws, that there's nothing special or different about the heavens, that they work by exactly the same laws as stones and apples falling uh, on Earth. This was really a tremendous impetus to, to realize the power of rationality. And so within 25 years, the whole attitude of everything changes tremendously. Uh, as the bubonic plague receded, for reasons we don't know that I showed you uh, that data, uh, in, then smallpox starts becoming the leading cause of death, one replacing the other. So as, uh, as opposed to what had gone on before, which was supernatural ideas about it, in the 1710s, uh, very shortly after Newton, the Royal Scientific Society, again started at this same time, began a search program, a research program, to gather information from any place in the world on how smallpox could be controlled or cured. Just a new kind of way of dealing with disease that just hadn't been seen before. And so what did they find? They found that in Turkey, that they were inoculating uh, people. And what, what inoculation is, the early form is, they take someone who has the disease, they take pus from the disease, 
And what is pus? It's white blood cells that have eaten the virus or bacteria, and depending whether plague or smallpox, and have engulfed it, and they kill the, the bacteria virus, the pathogen. So you have a dead pathogen, but its molecules are still there. And so you can take the pus, inject it, cut, just cut the skin and put it on a person, and hopefully they're not exposed to any more of the live virus, but the dead, the, the, presumably the white blood cells have killed uh, the virus, and you just get their molecules, and that induces an immune reaction, and you become uh, Im immune uh, to this disease. Uh, local governments uh, started, I'll tell you more about the smallpox uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, in 1750s, again, this very early time, local regulations for sewage disposal, sewage disposal are, are getting started. Uh, in the 1790s, the rich start using water closets, which are toilets uh, of some sort. Not only do they introduce vaccination, but 1796, they try to make it better. They don't just say, oh, this works by some magic. They try to figure out what makes it better. And Jenner discovers vaccination, which is instead of using pus from a person who had smallpox, there's a very closely related disease called cowpox, which uh, cow maids, the, the milkmaids, uh, get very frequently. And it was noticed, because they're now observing all these things, that these women would get sick, but most of them would recover. This was not a lethal disease. So instead of taking the actual smallpox virus, which vaccination, the early inoculation did not always work, and you sometimes did catch the disease and died, taking it from cowpox rather than smallpox was less dangerous, but since the, the viruses are closely related to each other, um, the, a lot of the molecules are the same, and you get in, from cowpox you get immunity uh, to smallpox. And so these diseases start going down. And so not only in health, but it starts the Industrial Revolution uh, in 1711. Uh, James Newcomen uh, invents uh, the steam engine. It's a very, very inefficient <coughs> steam engine, and it's used only where you ha can have a very big uh, uh, emplacement, and it's used to pump water out of mines. Coal is becoming important uh, for England to fuel uh, the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> and you have mines that are underground and water seeps into them, you've got to suck out the water. So how do you pump it out? Well, he invents the steam engine. And then James Watt uh, figures out, looks at it more scientifically, more rationally. And again, just like inoculation being supplanted with vaccination, they start improving. It's not just that something works and our ancestors did it this way and we don't know why it works, we don't care it works, we do it the same way our ancestors did. No, they keep thinking about what they're looking at, what they're working on, and he improves it. And in this case, what James Watt did is after the steam comes out, he had a condenser to condense the steam, so drop the pressure on one side of the piston going out. So just by taking the condenser, instead of le letting, having a way of cooling the steam, uh, really improves the efficiency of a steam engine. And now with a greater efficiency, you can make a smaller steam engine that works just as well, and you can put it on wheels, and you can start getting the railroad and all kinds of smaller factories can start using uh, steam engines. Um, in politics, this idea is also terribly important. The previous idea was that of a hierarchical system with God appointing kings, uh, being ruling it over nobility, and then everyone else must obey up this chain. But what was Newton's idea? That Everything obeys the same law, gravity. That the sun attracts the earth, the earth attracts the sun, equal and opposite. There's no difference. The sun does not rule the universe, it's not better than the earth. It works by exactly the same rules, the sun and the earth, the earth and the moon. That everything acts by the same rules. There is no need for some sort of central sentient coordinator of all this, but each individual planet, each individual body, all bodies, apples, uh, working by their own laws, by the same laws as everyone else, the universe works beautifully. In fact, it works as, as it does work. This idea is very consciously taken over into politics. And 
the idea of democracy, again, changed that each person acting under his own desires, his own self-interest, uh, his own morality, can, by interacting in the same way the planets do, can come out with a system that works. And the original theorists of democracy were very, very conscious of this shift in the way they looked at the way the universe worked and very conscious of its, uh, its their debt to Newton on that. In economics, how many of you are economics majors? Oh, the, the bust has really taken effect. We used to have lots of economics majors. So, what is Adam Smith's idea? The, 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 the basis of, of modern economics is Adam Smith's, that no, you don't need a mercantilist government to control everything, that if each person acts in their own self-interest, by their own internal rules, then the economy will work just wonderfully and be uh, more productive. Uh, freedom of religion is again the same thing, freedom of conscience is a similar kind of idea, that each person has its own, has its own way of working things and that does not destroy the harmony of the universe. And so, um, we see that this rationality uh, changes everything about the way uh, humans live. <coughs> and one of its most important effects is demography, that the population uh, stops dying and can start increasing. And this is exactly what happens as all this rational attitude toward death and toward disease starts taking hold, the death rate falls tremendously, as, as I've shown you, the life expectancy goes up, infant mortality goes down, and population starts increasing tremendously. Most people at that time believed that a big population was a wonderful thing, and they're very optimistic about it, and one of the standard ways of judging a government, when you saw a country that had a lot of people in it, well, obviously the government was doing something right. The king at that time uh, was doing something right because people were able to stay alive. If you saw a country with a low population, well, something was wrong. And that was not necessarily a, a, an improper attitude. And so up until Malthus, uh, with some exceptions, there was generally the idea that there was no limit to population, that the more the population, the merrier. Malthus came along and said, hmm, there is problems with population. And um, he wa had been watching, uh, you know, he, he, he collected very good data. You read, you read his stuff, it's really wonderful to read because it's extremely modern in that he tells you the data he's collecting, he analyzes, he tells you what's, what he, what's wrong with the data, why, why he believes it to a certain extent but not beyond that. And, and and all things about the era of the, of the data. Very, he's writing in like 1798, but it reads like a modern uh, PhD thesis, uh, just about. And his, his knowledge was, was the following, and it's, and it's very simple what he said. He did not say, many people wrote that, as previous people had often said, like, like uh, Edmund Burke, who was the father of conservatism, that the economic pie is, is constant, there's just so much stuff out there. And the more people, you just have to divide the pie smaller and smaller. So that's one way of looking at it. And then it's perfectly obvious that population is, is a bad thing because there's fixed production and you have more people to eat up uh, that production. No, Malthus was much smarter. By the time he wrote in 1798, the Enlightenment had started to produce results. He could see that agricultural production uh, was Im improving year by year. Modern methods uh, were modern at that time, were beginning to take over, and he knew that production rose. And what he assumed and what he, what he saw from the data was that production rose linearly, that every year there was sort of, you could produce a little bit more out of the land. Now he said, but what about population, he said. In population, if you have 100 people, and they increase by, <coughs> let's say, 50%. That's 150 people. You've gained 50 people. But now from the next generation, you again grow by 50%. You're starting with 150 people. You have now, you're adding 75 people. So the graph 
uh, oh, I have, there is Blackboard here. This is time. This is agricultural product. And Malta said this is growing like this, which was quite reasonable for his time. But population, no matter where it starts, grows, he called it geometrically, we call it exponentially. So if it starts that there's just enough uh, food for people to eat, uh, then it almost immediately goes above food production. If it starts even below, it doesn't matter. It eventually rises, catches up with food production, and goes beyond it. So he believed that there was no doubt that population increases geometrically or exponentially, as, as we say. That means a certain percent a year may in, in, uh, increase 1% a year, or 2% a year, or 3% a year. But remember, that's 1% of an increasing number, so it's more and more. Whereas agriculture, he thought, increased linearly by the same fixed amount each year. And if that's the case, you're going to run into starvation. So he said, since, uh, since population can always outrun productivity, eventually you get into trouble. That whenever you increase the number of people, if, uh, if you ever, so you're at some sort of status, stasis level where resources fit the population. But then as you get some increase in productivity, it allows a rise in population only to match that. But then the greater number of people eat up that increase in productivity, so you're right back down to where you, he's, you started with. So his idea was that increasing population was not a good thing. It could not lead to any improvement uh, if it outran your productivity gains. And this led to all kinds of uh, what we now consider very conservative and even retrogressive political ideas. So poor laws. He was initially against poor laws. There's no sense to keep the poor alive because if you keep them alive, they're going to reproduce and make even more children and you're right back to where uh, you started from. Uh, so he was a, a, a strong conservative uh, in, in, in that sense. He later changed his mind as he got smarter about things. He was also aware of even though population could increase like this, maybe, and he was aware that people were smart enough to stop this in some way. So he knew about various methods of uh, contraception, withdrawal, uh, and so forth, and various perverse uh, sexual practices. Uh, but he was so opposed to them morally, as was everyone else in his time, that you should not control reproduction, that that was immoral, that he said, no, people are never going to do that, that what happens to balance it is not people uh, themselves controlling this in a very rational way, which he thought was not possible at that time, uh, but uh, famine would come in, disease would come in. Whenever your population got too big, people would get very poor. They were open to some disease. The disease would wipe you out. So you either starved directly immediately from uh, too much the population getting ahead of agricultural productivity. You either starved or you got so weak that diseases come through and wipe you out. Okay, we will, uh, time is up, we will continue onward next time.